Hey, hello and welcome everyone. We are so glad you can join us for the next hour as we discuss all things archaeology. We hope you, your families, and your communities are staying safe and healthy, and we assure you that our Crow Canyon family is thinking of you in this time of social and spatial distancing. It is important to acknowledge the indigenous cultures of the Four Corners region that resided on these lands in the past, who continue to reside on these lands now, and will do so in the future. The work that we do at Crow Canyon would not be possible without recognizing and honoring the generations of people who built these incredible civilizations that we learn from on a daily basis. Thank you for joining me in this acknowledgement. Those of you familiar with Crow Canyon and the work that we do know that we have an important and unique mission. For those of you who are new to our organization, the mission of Crow Canyon Archaeological Center is to empower present and future generations by making the human past accessible and relevant through archaeological research, experiential education, and American Indian knowledge. It is now my pleasure to introduce two of my talented friends and colleagues, Rebecca Hammond and Steve Copeland. Rebecca is a member of the Ute Mountain Ute Tribe and an educator and American Indian Initiatives Coordinator at Crow Canyon. She is a founding member of our Native American Advisory Group and a former intern. Becky is a graduate of the Museum Studies Program at the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe. She is a gifted artist and a master loom beater. She's been practicing archeology span for the last 27 years. Steve Copeland has worked at Crow Canyon since 2006 as a field archeologist. During the program season, you will find Steve teaching students and adults archeological field methods at the Haney site. Steve's research interests include architecture and material culture studies. Steve has been practicing archeology span in the Southwest for the past 31 years. My name is Susan Ryan, and I'm the Chief Mission Officer here at Crow Canyon. I'm an anthropological archeologist by training and have been practicing archeology span in the Midwest and Southwest for the last 26 years. My research interests include the built environment, the nature and extent of Chaco influence in the Northern Southwest, and identity formation. I've had the pleasure of serving Crow Canyon's mission since 1998. Between the three of us, we have 84 years of archeological experience, and we look forward to answering your questions to the best of our abilities. For those of you that are on Zoom, there's a question and answer button at the bottom of your screens where you can submit questions as they arise. For those of you watching on Facebook Live, you can type in your questions in the comments area on the video. We will try to respond to as many questions as possible during the next hour. However, if we're unable to address your questions at this time, we'll get back to you as soon as we can in email. So that being said, Becky and Steve, do you wanna say hi to everybody? Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Nice to be with you. All right. So ahead of time, we had some questions come in and we'll be monitoring, as we said, the live feed throughout this program. But we're going to go ahead and start with some questions that arrived earlier today. This one is from Cynthia from Colorado Springs. And Cynthia asks, how did you find the specialty in archaeology that was right for you? And what do you think most archaeologists have in common? So we'll start with Steve on this one. How did you Excellent. find the specialty that's right for you? Oh, that's a great question. Thank you, Cynthia. Um, I, I found the right for me by um, when I first started in archaeology, doing some contract archaeology, when I started working on uh, pit structures in the Phoenix area and the variability between the pit structures, different floor surfaces and what they're constructed of, that really uh, drew my interest. And I had some property south of Phoenix, so I went down and I actually built one of these little pit houses, and I really thought that uh, was interesting. So that's how I got interested in my specialty, which is architecture and material culture. How about you, Becky? Uh, so um, my my view on archaeology is actually a little bit different. I sort of kind of fell into the program and was really through the our museum studies program that I that I got involved in archaeology. Um, so it just sort of happened for me. It wasn't actually planned for me. 
And for me, I would say I was one of those kids that knew early on I was really interested in archaeology. And I remember having a moment right around first or second grade where I was in the school library and I opened up a book of George Catlin paintings. And I remember seeing images of longhouses and boats that were shaped like leaves that were made of skin. And I knew immediately I wanted to go into archaeology. And so as far as finding my specialty, I was lucky enough to have an aunt and uncle who moved out to Albuquerque from Chicago when I was a kid. And I came to visit them. And they were very instrumental in taking me to the uh, village of Acoma and to museums around Albuquerque and to look at petroglyphs. And so I immediately connected with the cultures of the Southwest and knew that I wanted to specialize in Southwestern archaeology. And then for my dissertation work, I really enjoyed the built environment, looking at architecture. And so I think you just have to look for things that you find really passion about. And that's going to give you insights into the specialties that you should go into. All right. Um, next question. How does modern technology help archaeologists? And in what ways could it be problematic? So, Steve, we'll start with you. Modern technology. I, I, this is a great question because we're just now getting a GPS unit that um, is going to help us map the site. And it's going to be quite efficient for us. It, it lets us map features a lot faster and more precision. Um, so these, these instruments are, have gotten so much more complex that they just work very well at the precision of mapping and for the report writing. Once we get out there and we can map in with the GPS unit, um, then we could download it onto the computer and then have a map right away. Back in the day, we used to make a map by hand, um, bring it in, copy it, draft it. Oh, it's a lot more time consuming. Um, not that it's any better for me, um, and, and honestly, I like teaching uh, students that come to Crow Canyon the old school way of mapping. Um, I think it just gives them a little better understanding. But the new technology definitely helps us um, get our product out to to our participants and customers and other people um, at like these webinars um, with the technology we're using now um, a lot better. But for mapping and other things, you can't replace the old trowel and the shovel. I don't think so. Yeah. Becky, anything to add? I just think that, you know, part of the, uh, you know, the uh, technology or, or, you know, I mean, it's, it was modern back then, but at the same time, um, you know, their, their technology and just learning and understanding it um, is something that we like to do here at Crow Canyon by doing that experimental archaeology. And I think that's part of one of the things that I really like about archaeology is to be able to figure out how they made the stuff kind of the old way, but then you got this other way of thinking about, you know, how we can use, you know, GPS, how we can use, you know, drones nowadays to figure out and you know, look at the village from up above. Uh, but, you know, a lot of it too is just really trying to figure out, you know, how things were made that the ancestral Pueblo people or you people or any other people from the past use that, that, that technology. Good. Okay, the next question is, what is the value of experimental archeology? span So for example, making stone tools or pottery or recreating uh, chemical residues found on pottery. And what kinds of things can we learn from experimental studies? Steve, do you wanna start? Absolutely, yeah. I think experimental archaeology is pivotal because um, as, as like I was talking earlier about the, the pit house architecture, um, when we excavate a pit house, we're assuming that these processes happen and then we uh, map them in and, you know, we, as we excavate them, we, we come up with an idea of how it was constructed. But experimental archaeology can help us kind of ground truth that, i.e. the same as Electrical resistance can help us look for things under the ground, but then we can go back and lay an excavation unit over that and see if that's really a, a, a room block or a pit. So experimental archaeology, in my view, can help us ground truth what we see and um, to see if it really works like that. So I think it's a great, a great thing. Plus for teaching. I mean, um, how else are we going to teach about this stuff? Uh, when Tyson makes a projectile point, I think it really... Uh, 
solidifies how long it takes to make that point. And when he's working with the kids and, and, and the adults with that, it really lets them understand uh, the, the time it takes to make these, these tools, to skin a high, to make an awl, to make the other things, especially pottery. I mean, Paul would tell you, uh, you don't just throw a bunch of clay together. Um, you need to experiment how to fire it, what slip works well. So by us doing it, we can learn about the technology of the past. Um, and I think that's very important for teaching here at Pro Canyon. Any thoughts, Becky? Yeah, for, for us teaching, but also when we, you know, because one of the cool things about Crow Canyon is that we do a lot of hands-on. And by doing the hands-on teaching and getting the kids to understand and learn how long it would take to make a, a piece of cordage, you know, and how to make pottery and given that idea, but then also being able to go to the lab and seeing what type of temper this clay had in it. And so then the kids will then get that better idea of why something took so long to make and, and just amazed that it lasts that long, you know, um, and throughout the history. Yeah, one of the questions we almost always get when we're teaching how technological style changes through time is about why pottery goes from plain gray, meaning that it's just smoothed on the outside to having corrugations. And those corrugated bumps on the pot could have a function, meaning that um, through experimental archeology span studies, we've realized that by heating up the pots that have coils that are exposed on the surface area, it actually creates the, the, the heat to be um, heated up equally along the pot. And so there are things we can learn from experimental studies that we're testing things like resiliency of a pot, how much pressure can it hold? Um, how is it heating up? What are the thermodynamics like of that jar? So there's, there's lots of things we can ask about it. And if we create something um, in the modern time, that means we can actually do destructive analyses on that too, whereas we wouldn't want to do that with ancient artifacts. Yeah, that's a good point, Susan. We all, we always want to do a feature farm. We want to uh, dig some some pits and features and then let them fill naturally over five or ten years. And then here at Crow Canyon, come back and excavate those with our students to see if they look like the real pit that we see at uh, the Haney site, for example. So our feature farm is something we really want to do and um, see if it, it has the same results. That's a great idea. Another one of my um, favorite experimental study stories comes from um, in the 1980s, a graduate student at Washington State University, uh, Glennie was his last name. He recreated an entire pit house just to understand how pit houses were burned uh, at depopulation. And what he realized was that, um, you know, that these pit houses were not destroyed by fire by accident that you would actually have to remove a ton of the adobe off of the wooden rafters inside of the structure to get it to ignite. And so that ruled out this concept of possibly cooking dinner and having a spark go up from the heart <laughs> and ignite the roof. Um, yeah. It also ruled out, you know, accidental anything having to do with fire because he really did show through experimental archaeology that it takes a lot of work to light those on fire. So it just teaches us so much, not about just the timing of things, but about how things behave. And it allows us to understand human behavior in the past, again, without um, destroying the archaeological record. All right, let's go on to a question from our friend John Mayer. And uh, we have a question here about Chaco. So he's asking, Considering the multi-story architecture of Chaco Canyon and that some of these buildings were built in the 800s AD, including Pueblo Benito, where did the prototypes for these buildings come from? <laughs> and I can uh, go ahead and take a stab if you guys want. Yeah, uh, go for it. You know, one of the theories is that right here in our backyard in the Dolores, Colorado area, which is about 10 miles north of Crow Canyon, we possibly have some of the very first forms of Chacoan architecture. So two of our colleagues, um, Rich Wilshusen and Ruth Van Dyke, wrote an article that suggested that the architecture dating to the Pueblo I period, so about you know, 750 to 950 AD, uh, down in the Dolores area, could actually be the very beginnings of Chaco-style architecture. 
And the reason for that is these room blocks are arced or horseshoe shaped. And oftentimes when you think about how Pueblo Benito was started, for example, it didn't start as a D shape. It actually started in a C shaped, uh, horseshoe shaped kind of a, a plan. And so um, there is a theory that the beginnings of Chaco could have been up here in the Mesa Verde region. Yeah, Susan, to add to that, um, we're, we're actually finding some of those arced room blocks at our current excavations at Haney on the west side. It appears that some of those early um, room blocks, those Pueblo One room blocks may be arced and there may be more of them down south of Haney. So um, these are sitting right underneath great houses. So maybe there's some proto great houses that originated up here and transitioned into the great house model that we see and it very well could have been at Chaco as well. So we're seeing evidence of that in our current excavations. Big paper to come. Okay. Anything back here or should I keep going? Keep going. I might, yeah. I'd love to see anything. <laughs> okay. So, Becky, this one is going to go out to you. How would someone without an archaeology degree or background get started? Well, what do you should ask? No. Um, well, the thing is, is uh, what happened with me is I had to do um, – an internship which led me to do it working with our tribal park and looking at our artifacts. And we were building our farm fields behind the ute. And they so it was, you know, CRM work and they needed people out there to do the archaeology. And, you know, I uh, asked my grandfather after I talked to my mother and said, you know, yeah, I'd like to try this archaeology thing and and talk to him, got approval. Uh, to do the archaeology because I just couldn't go out there and do it without um, without my grandfather and talking to him. And, you know, for me, you know, just going into CRM work and just being able to go out and, and learn about the archaeology, I didn't have, like, you know, like you said, I didn't have the degree, but I had the interest and I spent five years out in the field doing archaeological work. And so... So it was a uh, it was a, a learning process during that time, and then you know being able to teach all about it and having the experience and and learning from our Native American advisory group members about their culture, and so so for me it just kind of happened and and you know I I really do enjoy teaching students about the archaeology. Steve, yeah, I, I would say um. <clears throat> Volunteer is, is a good thing. We, you know, we take volunteers at Crow Canyon, but you can get involved in your local archaeological chapter. Um, there's a lot of different archaeological associations that you can get involved in um, to get some experience. Um, you can also uh, come to Crow Canyon and take one of our programs. Um, we offer programs for all ages. So um, that, that's probably what I would do. And for me, like I say, I, I, I have a bachelor's degree in archaeology and I'm mostly a field archaeologist. And um, yeah, that, that's probably what I would say. Yeah, and I would also suggest internships. I would suggest yeah. getting hooked up with your local uh, advocational archaeology chapter because they have lots of great connections to the state archaeologist and other wonderful volunteer opportunities that could be happening in your region. Uh, the other thing is if you're looking to go back to school to become an archaeologist, Look for a program that offers professors that have specialties that you might find interesting. And that way they can become your mentors and advisors and help you along the way. Definitely. Okay. Let's go back to another question here coming in on the feed. <clears throat> All right. Let's go to, we'll start with Becky on this one. This uh, comment is, I would love to hear some stories about how consultation between tribal representatives and archaeologists has resulted in new interpretations or understanding of archaeological findings. Uh, you know, uh, sure. Consultation. I think, uh, you know, one of the things about Crow Canyon is Crow Canyon was, you know, one of the first uh, groups to actually put together a Native American advisory group and um, and being able to learn and understand about uh, the past cultures and putting that into what we do here at Crow Canyon uh, 
is, you know, that's really important. And, you know, being able to have the consultation, I think NAGPRA has also brought in um, a lot more of a native perspective in archaeology. And, and you know, you, you know, when you look at it, we're studying other people's cultures, so why not get them involved? You know, and that and that's really an important thing to learn and understand. And I think that helps us as archaeologists and as educators looking into other past cultures and getting a better understanding of of these past cultures and, and having that native input is really, really important. And it's something that uh, Kirk Canyon has been working on. And uh, you know, in, in in learning and understanding about those cultures, and we use uh, our Native American Advisory Group, or our Pueblo Advisory Group today, uh, and learning and understanding really in what they would like to learn and understand, and also you know our farming project that uh, our institute has been doing, um, Pueblo Farming Project, and learning and understanding the ways that. Uh, Hopi farmers are, are, have have been farming for hundreds of years, and and getting that input and understanding that you know is really really important, and and having that consultation is is so so important. And that's one of the ways that you know and the steps that we did here at Crew Canyon. Yeah, one of my favorite stories is um, when Crow Canyon was working with our Native American Advisory Group. Uh, discussing plans to open up what we call the Pueblo Learning Center, which is an experiential um, Pueblo II replica building where students are able to go in and in and out of the rooms and experience different lifestyle activities as part of that time period. And part of that consultation that we had, um, it came out amongst the tribal members that we should not be constructing a kiva along with the surface rooms and the tower that were part of that plan. And the reason for that is because people that are initiated into Kiva groups are the only ones that should be entering a Kiva. And so that was a wonderful learning opportunity for us to take that advice. And now when we bring our students up to the Pueblo Learning Center, they can see the tower, they can see the surface rooms, but there is no Kiva. And that is just an incredible learning opportunity to explain to the students why it's not there and also talk about the process of how that whole learning center came to be. So, Steve, do you have anything before I go on? Yeah, I would say what Becky hit on is the Pueblo Farming Project um, with Mark Varian and Paul Ermagiotti um, and the consultation with our Native American partners on that. We've learned so much about ancient farming practices, um, the gardens, where plants grow, the cold air drainage. But we also want to take that, what we've learned from that, and Kellen would like to apply that to the current project that we're working on, some of that uh, cold air drainage and the soil type. Um, Paul came out and said, red soil, can't farm here. We're not sure we agree with that, but we're going to try to apply some of the techniques that, were, uh, the, that they learned from the Pueblo Farming Project and apply those. So we've learned a lot. That, that was probably a real eye-opener for me about uh, ancient farming uh, practices here in the Four Corners area. And, uh, it's a, one of the best projects. So hopefully we can take that and learn from it and apply it to future projects. Okay, our next question comes from Moana, and she asks, how is Southwestern archaeology different from archaeology in other places in the United States? Thank you, Steve. Oh, I would hey, say, there you go, Steve. yeah, for me, um, <laughs> it's the preservation, right, uh, Moana? Um, you Having excavated here, uh, you when you went down into that kiva, you saw all the fill still intact. There's potential to find... Um, uh, perishables, in, and we did find some on the project, but the preservation here in the Southwest is just so uh, beautiful that um, we're able to um, dig less and have a better interpretation of what we find because of the preservation. Um, so for me, that that is like the, the biggest thing. Yeah, and for me, I would say having done Midwestern archaeology, one of the best things about being a Southwest archaeologist is having descendant community members to talk to. These are the people that are on the landscape today, and they are able to have dialogues with us about what we're researching. And the insights that they can provide 
absolutely fill out all of our understanding of the archaeological record in ways that we can't do in other places around the United States. So um, that's really important to those of us that work here. All right, Becky, all right. anything? Good? Okay. All right, uh, this question comes from Denise. How do you make your research relevant to what is happening today? Susan, you better take that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, this one is a really, really important question, and it's also a difficult question. Uh, the reason that we exist as archaeologists, in my mind, is because we want to make a contribution to make society better. And so because we are afforded the opportunity to do research on the long-term duration, meaning through centuries and possibly even thousands of years, we have a perspective on the past about decision-making that humans made that were either really great decisions and things worked out wonderfully or possibly decisions that didn't go so well. And it's my hopes and dreams. That all of the work that we do is going back to this concept of how do we make society better by learning from the past. And so no matter what it is that we're, we're studying right now, whether it be human environment interactions and the choices that people made in the past, or whether it be what happens when there's a complete breakdown in social structure and everything is changed within a culture. What can we learn from that to bring it forward? Um, and so do I think we do it really well? No, I think archeologists have had um, uh, probably a lack of making those connections in the past. That being said, it is incredibly important, especially if we wanna make contributions to our policymakers who are working every day towards making society better as well. Becky or Steve? I think you summed it up right there. Good job. Good job. Okay. Um, here's a fun one from an anonymous mm -hmm. attendee. When you wake up in the morning, what is your motivation? So why do you do what you do and why do you love it? Go ahead, Becky. Oh, uh, you know, I I you know, for me, I love teaching about archaeology. I love uh, trying to get get the kids to understand uh, a past culture and think about it in the way of of the people that were here and how they would make something or how they would they would build it. You know, here at Coro Canyon, I actually get to teach the kids how to make fire, and I get to teach this teach them how to throw a weapon, and I get paid for it. And you know, I mean, that's that's great. You know. And the kids are amazing, and the kids have really great questions. I don't think that um, I'm ever bored when I go to Mesa Verde, you know, with each school group that we go on, because there's always a kid that's going to have a different question that, that I have never thought about, you know, and, and being able to, to teach them about the different time periods that were here in this area and then when you get to Mesa Verde that you get the aha moments where they're like oh I get it I get it you know and I mean that's amazing you know and it's it's fun so for me that's what I do mean. and you know I work with really great people and you know everybody's so wonderful here and everybody uh helps each other and uh supports each other and it's a, you know for me that's great Definitely. I, I echo a lot what Becky said. Um, being an archaeologist, no day is ever boring because they're all different. I wake up every day and I never know what I'm going to be doing. Um, I could be working with kids one day, uh, adults the next day. Um, it just, it's never the same. But um, the, uh, the excitement to work with the kids, like Becky said, and, and their faces and the learning, but also the adults. We have lifelong learners that come here, um, like Scott Evans uh, and, and folks I've uh, worked with others in the past. A lot of you are probably listening to this uh, right now. But that that's the beauty about this job. And, and um, waking up every day is not a problem. I, I look forward to getting out to the site and the fresh air and getting ready for the people to come. And what am I going to learn today? I will never know everything about archaeology if I live to be 500 years old, which I may. Um, but I can tell you this, every day I learn more and more and it goes up in there and I share it with others. So I wake up every day and enjoy coming to my job, to work. Um, we don't even call it work here, really. We just wake up and do what we naturally like to do. And like Becky said, yeah, we get paid for it, but it's worth it. So that's my take. 
Yeah, I agree with both Becky and Steve. I think people that are drawn to archaeology are lifelong learners, and we have way more questions than we have answers. And so we love coming to work every day, wondering what it is we're going to find out. And this occupation allows us to feed that need to keep learning throughout our lifetimes. And we, like Steve said, we'll never, ever, ever run out of questions. We'll never run out of information to be learned. And then we all love sharing that as our passion here at Crow Cannon. We love teaching the things that we're finding out because it inspires people and it inspires people to, to do different things in society. It's just an amazing uh, job to have. It truly is. And I'm also very passionate about our mission. I think we're unique. We have a different way of looking at archaeology than most organizations do. And that is something that also keeps me wanting to come back to work on a, on a daily basis. All right, so the next question is from Arabella from New Jersey. If you could go back and change your career, would you? And are you happy as an archaeologist? We probably just kind of answered that one. Would you change your career if you could? No. I probably wouldn't. Um, I, I I enjoy being outside. It's um it's something that uh, I didn't want to be an archaeologist. And archaeology just I, uh, I started studying it. Um, I was in the College of Business and realized that is not my career. Um, and but I would not. I would not go back and change. I think I've uh, enjoyed it thoroughly throughout my thirty years of of doing this work. My back would say yes, change your career, and, and uh, but I, but otherwise, no, not even close. I would. What would you do? I would actually do more of my artwork. That that's what I think I would do, and maybe a little bit of archaeology because the kids are amazing. <laughs> okay, well, and yep. you're still doing both at the same time, so that's a good life, right? That's not bad. Okay, so the next question is Teresa, but also Elaine Franklin. They're asking us about our education um, projects that are going on at Crow Canyon right now, especially given the fact that we're doing a lot more distance learning and distance education for our students. And so, Becky, do you want to comment on some of the current projects that we're working on in the education department? Sure, just, just like uh, Susan was saying, we're doing a lot of uh, distance learning. We're uh, working with a, a few, a number of schools that have not been able to come uh, where, we, 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 where we have recorded uh, our activities up at the Pueblo and the Pit House, uh, throwing with the Atlat all, making fire, um, various activities that are happening so that we can actually um, have the, the classes actually watch, our, watch um, some of our programs that we're doing. Um, we are working currently on our youth curriculum that uh, we're working with, and we have a teepee, which is kind of cool. And uh, so it'll be another outdoor classroom. And so we're doing a youth curriculum, and we're also working on a Navajo curriculum. And so there are some of these uh, the stuff that we're working on right now. And so it's a, uh, you know, it's a little more. It's pretty exciting because we're going into something a little bit different and not just doing Pueblo because we all know that, you know, as Elaine would always say, everybody's history matters. And that, you know, for us you people, we've always been in, in Colorado and we've always lived here. And uh, and so we're gonna teach a little bit about that youth history and Navajo as well. So that's kind of exciting. And so that's something new. Great. Okay, so Steve, we have a few questions that relate to the Northern Chaco Outliers project and of course the Haney site. And most of the questions are asking, what have we learned in the past year? And what is really interesting going on that you wanna share with people? Oh, great question. We've learned a lot. Um, I would say the big takeaway um, from the Haney project uh, in the last year and a lot of folks know because they dug with us last year, but I'm just going to kind of give the big takeaway is um, that the west side of the West Great House, we're learning that there is um, much, uh, a lot uh, earlier component um, associated with, uh, with the Haney property. For example, we have 
several P1 pit structures, a um, couple of one pit structures, and maybe some arcing room blocks that Haney probably had a, a substantial Pueblo One occupation prior to the building of those great houses. So that that's kind of like the, the big takeaway. And, that, and that's big. I mean, that tells us that the great houses didn't just uh, get plopped down there uh, one day with no occupation underneath them. So that that's super important. We're also learning um, from other properties in the region and the area of the Wallace property uh, and Bruce Bradley's property that those uh, sites may have um, some earlier components as well. So we're expanding the boundaries of the Lakeview group and the Haney community, uh, Wallace and Ida Jean as well. And that's, that's super important. That was one of our research questions is how big was the community? And we're actually uh, learning that there's quite a few small houses in the area and we're going to be mapping those and um, doing some artifact tallies. Hopefully uh, the lab, hopefully we'll take, take, take that on a little bit. So I would say that's the big takeaway. We've also done some elect, uh, electrical resistivity um, in some of the plowed fields and over uh, Greenstone Pueblo, which is just west of Wallace, getting the layout of those uh, those sites. So um, a lot going on. When you guys come back, uh, folks come back to dig with us, we'll give you the, the big picture from the intro to research. But uh, that's kind of the big picture takeaway from our from our Haney work. Yeah, and I'll uh, piggyback on this because Richard Cordell was asking about our remote sensing work also at the Wallace site. And um, for those of you that don't know, we are fortunate enough to be the recipients of a History Colorado State Historical Fund grant that is allowing us to do remote sensing work at the Great House Village, uh, the Wallace site, which is about 335 meters to the south of Haney. And what's so cool is that we're using a practice called electrical resistivity, which is where we have a machine that has two metal teeth on the bottom and we push those teeth into the ground and there's an electrical current that's passed between those two teeth. And as the current passes in the ground, it's measuring the ease or the difficulty of that current moving through the soil. So if you can think back to your high school science classes, in order for a current to conduct, it actually has to be touching something. And if it's not touching something, there's usually an air pocket or something else there that's stopping it. So that's where the resistivity part of that survey comes in. So for us, we're looking for areas in the ground that have been disturbed by the ancient people living there. And so things like pit houses or kivas would be examples of ground disturbance. And what we're doing right now is clearing the vegetation from the top of that site, and we're laying out a grid, and we're taking data points at a very specific um, measured interval. And I think what we're doing is what, every 50 oh, centimeters to a meter? 50, 50 centimeters by one meter wide, yeah. Yeah, and so we're collecting data about the resistance of that electricity moving through the soil, which gives us an amazing picture of um, basically what we call anomalies. And those anomalies are the disturbed areas compared to the intact soils surrounding the anomalies. And what that does for us is it allows us to map the site in a way that we can't see it just from doing survey on the surface alone. The other wonderful thing about using a resistivity survey is that it's not invasive. So we don't have to disturb a non-renewable resource, the archaeological record, in order to gather data from that site. So when we have that all cleaned up and processed, that data, we'll be able to interpret the anomalies that are there at that village. And then we'll be able to say tenfold about the place that we're studying compared to not doing that type of survey. Hey, Susan, I, I've got it up on the screen, some raw data. You want to look at it real quick? Yeah, it might be pretty pixelated, so you may have yeah, to it your might be. out. This is new stuff, you guys. We're trying this really quick, and uh, you're the first to see this. And th this is the, the data that we're looking at from Greenstone Pueblo. And, um, and you can see right here these dark spots. That's a pit structure. Here's another one. Here's another one. And the room block is right up in here. Um, and we're still interpreting this stuff over here. It looks like you can see maybe something in here. And we'll send it to our expert, Mona Charles. She'll uh, do some processing on this. But this is raw data. It's just hot off the press. We just collected this, and it's on the laptop. But um, this is just kind of a little bit uh, like Susan was saying about how this uh, instrument works. 
So pretty, pretty neat stuff is I'm going to switch back. Good, Steve. All right, so we'll send the next question to Becky. What do native communities think about archeology span and archeologists and specifically the excavations that are performed as part of the study of previous habitations? And this question comes from Aurelia. That's a really great question. You know, archeologists in the past have actually never really been good to native people. And, you know, for me, uh, it was really hard being doing archeology, span uh, mainly because I had, you know, friends, relatives, uh, who would always call me, uh, you know, a grave digger. Uh, and, you know, because it was part of what uh, Native people have always seen archaeologists do. And, you know, for me, uh, you know, being an archaeologist and teaching Native kids about archaeology is really, really important. You know, and I tell my kids, you know, if we don't excavate or we don't become archaeologists, we're always going to have somebody out excavating our path and if we can become archaeologists then we can teach the past the way we want people to read about us and that's really important and and as we start to become more and more you know more native people going into the archaeology we, we we would have a little bit more of that control of of you know digging and excavating your site i don't like the word digging so excavating um at the site and and uh being able to um write it down and write it the way we would like people to read it and so uh you know being an archaeologist and teaching all about it and being respectful and you know that's part of you know one of the the reasons of being here at crow canyon is part of it is the respect of being able to uh and how people treat a site because some archaeologists aren't that great at um you know excavating a site without being so respectful. And I think that's one of the things that's really nice about Kukana. Great. All right, the next question is for Steve from Paul. And Paul writes, do you have dates on the dendros from the pit house at the Haney site? Paul, that's a great question. Um, we, we don't have any dates from the, the, the pit houses yet. We sent those in um, this winter and to the University of Arizona Tree Ring Lab. And um, those guys with the precision work that they do uh, and a huge sample that would be the only place that does that work. It takes several years, if not longer, to get our results back from those uh, dendros that we sent in. But I can tell you, um, um, Scott Evans and I brought out the tree ring sequence from the lab, which is by no means uh, what the tree ring lab would do. And we roughly match some up and we have an idea that based on other features in there, that that structure, uh, 1024 may date somewhere between 840 and 900 plus or minus. And that's, that's our guess, but we don't have uh, many dates from dendros back from the site yet. Okay, here's a tough one. This is from Margaret, and she asks, how does what we are going through with this pandemic shape any of your thinking of how past unforeseen events may have caused activities of ancient cultures to come to a sudden grinding halt? Halt, excuse me. So basically, are we seeing evidence of in the past of, of something like that's happening today cause disruptions in society in the past? Uh I would say if we think about the droughts, uh, you know, the, the droughts that occurred in the past, the 900s, 1100s, 1200s, um, could that be similar um, when people aren't eating? Um, maybe that could be a, a similar event that may have happened. Susan or Becky? Yeah, I mean, that's a really great question. And, yes. uh, uh, you know, you can see some of that evidence not here in the United States, but maybe like in Europe, you know, um, and, and the writing of, you know, like a plague, you know, you, you of course you don't see it archaeologically, you know, like in this area, I don't think, but, you know, with the evidence of, of the drought um, and, you know, uh, we could figure, figure that out. But that's a really great question. 
Yeah, I think um, when I think about the 1130 to 1180 drought, which was the longest prolonged, most severe drought um, in the history of the western half of the United States, I think about what happens from the Chaco to the post-Chaco periods. And so we go from these massive great house villages to having great houses that are very small in size um, and what we would call a McCalmos great house. And I often wonder if there was some kind of economic recession that may have taken place as a result of that drought where, like in our case in 2008, and also what is about to happen now, there's a lot of building that just basically stops. And there's building that um, maybe was planned, but we can't afford to do anything in that scale like we could before. And so everything kind of reduces and possibly even comes to a standstill. And so I often wonder if we can frame what's happening today, um, looking at the past to see what kind of disruptions do we see in society and culture. Um, the other big one that comes to mind for me would be the major organizational shifts that are taking place in the 1250s. So right before people migrate out of the Mesa Verde region, before depopulation, uh, they, there seems to be a, a significant change in social structure going on. And it could be political, it could be economic, it could be religious, it could be all of those things. But there's something that precipitates that going on. Um, do we know if it was something negative? It's hard to say, uh, kind of like a pandemic. Um, I don't think that's the case, but I do think something is breaking down. And it's our job as archaeologists to think through that, the, the causes, the reasons for why those shifts are happening. Yep. Okay, um, let's move on to another question. Becky, this one is for you from Nancy. And Nancy is asking, since you've been here for over 22 years at Crow Canyon, what changes have you seen over the decades? Uh, you know, I've seen, uh, you know, the add-in of our Native American Advisory Group, uh, which changed into our Pueblo Advisory Group. Um, I've seen, you know, that, that more of that input in uh, Native perspective. Uh, and I've also seen, you know, the various changes from, you know, looking at uh, some of the older sites, you know, P3 sites, uh, we went into Basket Maker. Um, so, you know, and, uh, you know, one of the nice things that uh, that I don't see as a change is you still have Susan Ryan, Mark Varian, Paul Urbagiotti, um, and all the people here who have been here even longer than I have. You know, and and I love that non-changing, but being able to be open and, and looking at um, various ways of excavation. And, you know, we're talking, you know, we're looking at now and seeing how part of that technology changes and how we're using drones and how we're using, you know, uh, remote sensing and other and other things. So you see some of these bigger changes of, of thinking more, you know, thinking on a bigger scale and adding in that native perspective as well. So some really great changes. Um, and uh, so, yeah, there's, there's, there's quite a few changes that are happening, but those are the ones that are coming right to my, to my head at this moment. So. Okay, we have a question that's a follow-up from a previous webinar with Steve Lexon on T-shaped doorways. And this is from Mary Jane in Tucson. Um, is there any chance that the people at Chaco or Mesa Verde had some roots going back to Palenque? And so, Steve, I'll let you go ahead and start with that one. Well, th thanks. Um, <laughs> uh, well, A, I'm not going to follow up from Steve Lexon, that's for sure, because uh, he's an expert on that. But um, my feeling is uh, I, I, I think there possibly is. Um, uh, we, we look at uh, the, the, the big sites down in Mexico, and um, I, I I do think that there is some roots there, uh, as as some of the Hopi folks would say that they are originated down there. And I, I do think that um, there's something to be said for this eastern western basket maker, and maybe these eastern folks came up the east side of Sierra Madres, and the western folks up the other. But we do see those T-shaped doorways up here. We see them at um, at uh, Wallace Ruin, they open up onto the plaza area. Bruce has some is uh, at that site. We see him at Pocky May, like Steve Lexon said. So my my gut feeling tells me yes, which more research needs to be done on that. 
We need to look at those sites in between, uh, not only Palenque, but northern Mexico, um, the Valley of Mexico, and see if we can see any connection between those. That's a that's another huge project, but um, my my feeling is there there very well could be a, some roots in that. Becky, what about you? Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, the one that, with the chocolate, is that that's what they are? <laughs> and uh, um, the, the T-shaped doorways and, and that perspective on Mexico, is that what? Um, you know, part of the thing is, is when we're looking at uh, parts of those connections is we know that uh, Hopi, Ute, um, we are all in that uh, Uto Aztecan language. So part of that uh, connection with people coming up and, you know, people are doing that great deal of trading coming in and out of Mexico. And you got people all along, you know, the, the Colorado River, you know, coming up into that Great Basin area. And so you got that connection with with um, language and tribes and people. So there's, you know, there's gotta be something probably even for yourself than we're even imagining. Okay, um, this next question comes from Tom in Durango and he's asking about the function of D-shaped structures. And do we have any sense of how they're used? Um, any idea of why they're in close proximity to one another um, and you know, Steve, what can you tell us about D-shaped structures? D-shaped structures. Well, we, uh, as part of our Goodman Point project, we excavated, Kristen Puckelman excavated a D-shaped structure. There's also one at Sand Canyon. They appear to be late in the Pueblo III uh, time period. Um, most of them are pretty similar. They, uh, they have an oversized kiva in one half and two other kivas on, in the other half. The one at Goodman Point has a by wall around it. Um, so I, I would say, you know, they're integrative structures, probably used for um, political uh, use, probably by the folks running the show at the, at the structure. They have restricted access. The one at Goodman Point only had one doorway into it, multiple walls. So I think they're pretty special. Um, talking to Bruce Bradley the other day out at, at Wallace, he wrote a paper about uh, the, the function of these Ds. Are they um, kind of a reckoning back to old times? Uh, they do look like great houses. They look like uh, Pueblo Benito. Um, they're situated over springs. Um, the great houses that we see are situated over seeps or springs. So maybe there's some relevance there. Um, I think Bruce is definitely onto something. I, I think that's a possibility as well. Well, they're hearkening back to... Um, to the great house era when they build these is D-shaped structures. Obviously uh, there's oversized structures, which could indicate uh, more important folk living in that particular structure. Um, they occur real late. Um, we don't see them after that. So that's kind of what we know. There's not very many of them um, in, in the Mesa Verde region. Um, so that's my, my take on those. Okay. Uh, we have another question from Tom in Bayfield. And he says, in excavations, are animal remains such as bones, feathers, or fur often found, um, as such as from domesticated turkeys or hunted animals? How are they identified to the species? And are DNA analyses now possible? Yes, they are definitely found. We have um, faunal remains at every site we excavate, and that's part of our research question is, what kind of animals were being uh, eaten, what kind of animals were being utilized, what tools from those animals. Um, and we can tell the difference because we have comparative collections. For example, we have a rabbit, a bunny collection. So when we get faunal remains in from the site, we excavate it up, we bring it into the lab. Um, we have uh, ex-interns and other folks that are working on their PhDs that are um, experts at faunal analysis and we'll contract with them. And they'll look at that comparative collection. They'll see a, a modern bunny and they'll look at it and say, yes, it's a cottontail or it's an elk or it's uh, actually uh, we have a possibility of some mammoth at the Haney site, which is extremely rare. And so we want to, there's very little comparative uh, data on that in our database. So we want to make sure that that's, uh, it's actually mammoths. <laughs> so we'll analyze that. And so, um, yes, that, that's how we do it. <laughs> Fur, not so much. Hey, there's the turkey right there. <laughs> yeah, 
So wow. this is our live camera at Crow Canyon's campus, and we don't have a marmot, but we do have a wild turkey in view. Yep. Right. So we'll look at that, and then uh, there has been folks that have been uh, that's been doing some DNA uh, samples on turkeys as well, so we can look at that and compare the different species. So that's that's how we do it. Okay, so everybody, we are running out of time. I'm going to ask one more question that just came in, which is a really fun question before we start to wrap things up. This is from our friend Susan. And she's asking, if you could get into a time machine and go visit an ancient site, would you? If so, what time period and or place might you choose? And what would you ask the people you met there, assuming you were able to communicate? we will start with you, Becky. Wow. Oh, so many places, so many things. I, I don't know. I think I'd have to pick something pertaining to my my own tribe and, and finding out more information from that. So um, for me, that I, yeah, I would pick that. But there's so many great choices though. Egypt, yeah, yeah. Um, Machu Picchu, Europe, yeah. That, that's not a fair question. <laughs> <There's so many. laughs> hey, how about you? Yeah, that that that's that's a that's a great question. For me, I, I'm kind of uh, I'd go back to my old school roots down in the Phoenix Basin and uh, Hohokam area. Um, that's that's where I would go and, um, inside my pit house, and um, yeah, that that's uh, that's where I would go and that's what I would do. And the question I would ask is, um, were rivers the Salt River and the Gila River, I've always been intrigued about, um, were they uh, highways, uh, rafts? Did you have rafts floating down there to other communities as Chaco roads were? So I've always wondered about that. And that's the question I would ask. But I'd also just, um, just you know, just everyday life um, it is what do you do every day? And take me with you out to the fields and show me not as much ask a question but i would want for them to show me um and i think that would be a a really exciting uh time machine trip for me to the hokam region yeah probably is no surprise to my colleagues i'd want to be put into chaco canyon in the 1050s just to see the height of that incredible place uh, with thousands or hundreds of people living amongst the great house villages within the canyon um, and just to see the complexity of life that was going on on a daily basis would be absolutely incredible. I'm not sure I'd have specific questions. I think I'd just be in awe of watching what was going on in daily life. So yeah. that would be really fun to daydream about. And if we had a time machine, I'd be there in a heartbeat. Yeah. Okay, um, Dylan, we're going to go ahead and share my screen for a slide as we wrap this up here. Hey, Susan. Yeah. I've got, I've got a correction. Carrie just let me know that it wasn't mammoth. It was bison that we found out at Haney. That's what we're trying to look at. Not bison, uh, bison not mammoth. Oh, yeah. Good catch. <laughs> correction. Thanks, Carrie. That's why you're the lab manager. <laughs> okay. I'm going to put up a slide here. As I wrap this up and I uh, wanted to make you all aware of our next, oops, hang on, I've got the wrong slide. Give me one second here. I um, want to make you all aware of our next webinar that's coming up on Tuesday, May 12th at 3.30 Colorado time. This is brought to you by the Four Corners Lecture Series, the Crow Canyon Archaeological Center, the Bears Ears Education Center, and the Friends of Cedar Mesa. And Shauna Diedrichs and Meadow Colden will explore the images of Basket Maker Tea Society in canyons of Southeast Utah. So we're all looking forward to that. On a more serious note, Native communities have been greatly impacted by the COVID-19 virus, and we are sharing information on the screen right now for how to support organizations dedicated to providing some relief to our friends and our neighbors. So if you're interested in doing so, you can uh, check out this slide and the information for contact on that slide. We also want to thank all of you who have donated to Crow Canyon's Support Our Staff Spring Appeal. Your generosity has been overwhelming, and we can't tell you enough how much our staff appreciates you and your support, and that comes from all of us. Becky, Steve, and I, thank you for joining this program. It was really fun to launch our first Ask an Archaeologist webinar. 
There are many staff members working behind the scenes that are dedicated to the success of these programs. And we want to thank Dylan and Taylor and MJ and Jennifer and Jean and everyone else, Sarah, um, who makes these possible. And as I mentioned at the beginning of this program, we hope you, your families, and your communities are staying safe and healthy. And we assure you that our Crow Canyon is thinking of you and missing you in this time of social and spatial distancing. So thanks everyone for tuning in, be well, and we hope to see you as soon as we possibly can. So bye everybody. Thank you everybody. Everybody take care.